Okay. Hello, everyone. I think I've started a few seconds early, but I wanted to make sure I got everything functional and sounding okay. So I'm actually doing the launch live stream that I've wanted to do for a little while now. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm oh, because I'm slamming into everything. <clears throat> no meetings for me today, so I'm more casually dressed than I normally would be. But I figured no one really cares all that much. So I'm going to have a few uh, actual topics for us to to cover today because I did do some research thinking about what things do I do I want to focus on that I haven't been able to put a video together uh, covering this week. And so I do have a few items, actually I have three items, and I've already uh, filled out the description. So if I did it all right with this StreamYard thing, you all should be able to go and have access to uh, links to all of the items I'm going to talk about. So if anyone's catching this off of live in particular and you want to go and read more uh, in terms of detail than what I'm going to supply. I've tried to source everything ahead of time so that it's really easy to do. So with all of that said, let's go ahead and we'll start with the first one, which wasn't the most interesting to me. So I'll start with the boring one <laughs> since uh, since I only uh, only just now went live. Uh, and hello, I see Obese Tuna has joined us with my, my weird now normal actual lunchtime. Don't worry, I will not be eating on camera. I cannot stand it when people podcast or stream while eating. Uh, and so I actually ate before this, but I'm technically on my, oh, excuse me. You can tell I ate. I'm technically on my lunch break. So as where I'm working from home. So I guess my lunch break is whatever I want it to be. But let's go ahead and start with this company. I hadn't heard of this company. That's why I grabbed it. I'm not all that interested in the watch, though. I think it looks attractive. And that is, uh, the company is Tutima. I'm probably mis saying that because I see it's based in Glashuta. So I'm assuming this has got some sort of German pronunciation that I do not understand how to articulate. But they have announced their PVD watches, so the M27Cs S. And so there are a number of companies in, in Glashuta. I I was aware that there are far more than I always think of. Like when I hear Glashuta, of course, I think Glashuta Original because the name Glashuta is in the title. I think of Alangenzona because they're the most luxurious brand that's established in that town. And then there are a few others that, that crop up. Like there's a Union Glashuta, which isn't really sold here in the U.S., but it is part of the Swatch Group, so I'm aware of it. I don't remember whether or not Nomos is based in Glashuta. I suppose if someone in the chat knows, uh, feel free to shout it out because I I didn't do the research to check if it was or wasn't. I thought it was, but I'm not I'm not certain of that. Now, in terms of this watch itself, when I saw it, I thought, oh, that doesn't look very German to me. Which again, it's sort of like a well, what does a German watch have to look like, Dennis? Are we stereotyping it a little much? Uh, and that's probably because when I think of all of the Glashuta watches that I'm familiar with. I'm usually thinking more along the lines of their dress watch lines, which often have a certain almost clinical aesthetic, I would describe it. Like if you put them next to Swiss watches, usually uh, there's just a very, very different feel. Like German watches are often Bajas or they will, which is a really simplified, clean and balanced look. Uh, and that's really it's, I mean, it's a German school of thought is my understanding. So that makes sense. And then they also have a fondness for asymmetry. And that's where things like uh, Langenzona's Lange one and uh, the uh, Pano line, like the Pano Reserve and the Pano Lunars from Glashuta Original, those follow that sort of aesthetic, that motif. And so that's always just like the first things I think of. A dive watch to me, though, be it Japanese, Swiss, German, American, to me, they almost always look kind of the same which is the case here. And I see Obistuna has noted that uh, Glashuta is the traditional home of German watchmaking. And that was my understanding. Like before the Iron Curtain fell, like Glashuta was sort of where a lot, not all of it, but where a lot of it was and continued onward uh, when East Germany existed to some degree. There was no all long and zone. I think what is now Glashuta original was sort of like the conglomeration of all of those other German manufacturers that went away during the Cold War. And then once the wall fell in 89, there became a, a desire to restore having separate companies. And they are there. I mean, it must be great for finding, like, if you're a watchmaker and you're like, I'm tired of working for all Langa, I'm going to go over to Glashuta and get a different job. I guess you have that option available to you, which must be, which must be nice. I guess it's like their Silicon Valley, but for watches. So anyway, this, the watch itself, I mean, that it's PVD coded. 
And we've been seeing a lot more with PVD lately. Some of that, granted, is not the coding of watches themselves, but rather the dials. And I'm very much thinking of those Aquateras that came out earlier this year, where I believe almost all of the color schemes were PVD. I think the red one was, I think it was a CVD, a chemical uh, approach. But obviously, in this case, they're referring to the, this casing of the watch. I do like the green dial. We all love our green dials. Last year was the year of the green dial, but some people are still coming out with, with new iterations, obviously. But it was sort of interesting when I scanned this article earlier today. Uh, it's a 40 millimeter watch. And it's just because I didn't know anything about the company, I wasn't sure like it looks relatively high end. So I assumed this watch was going to run over $1,000. Uh, obviously, you could find under $1,000 dive watches. It's like the dive watch, and I've talked about this before, is the go-to watch for basically any micro brand. Like anytime there's a new micro brand that I hear about, my immediate stereotype is they're going to have a dive watch. In fact, I only expect them to have a dive watch. And I think in part that's because they're pretty simple to build. And I think in part they sell pretty well. So those two things combined make it a pretty logical entry point. Um, I don't know how well the uh, the PVD here would 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 hold up, but the uh, but overall I think it's a it's a really clean look. You know, date at the six, easy to read seconds hand. You've got the pip with the with the rotating bezel like you would expect with most dive watches. And okay, here it is. So nineteen hundred. So yeah, just under two thousand dollars US. So yeah, around kind of where I would I, where I would expect it. Uh, yeah, most of the. Uh, like I was thinking just now about German watches and like, what's the most affordable? If you wanted to get into German, what are the most affordable? I'm, are there, surely there are German micro brands. I, I don't know micro brands very well, so I, I can't name you any. If I were, if someone were to tell me they wanted a watch made in Germany, I would probably tell them Laco would be their most affordable choice. That's just because I'm pretty familiar with the Fliegers. And Laco offers a lot of Flieger options that use Japanese movements and are much cheaper than the other major uh, Flieger manufacturers. And I'm defining major as historic. So of the five companies that made Fliegers for the Germans back in World War II, all five companies exist today. Four of them still make Fliegers, all Long and Zona does not. But the other four do. And two of them, Stova and Laco, make a lot of different types. And Laco is the most affordable in terms of range. Like they got stuff up on the Stova line of pricing too, but they have some pretty inexpensive ones. But I'm kind of just going on about that. So anyway, uh, yeah, this is a, uh, so it's a, it's a PVD dive watch. I just thought it was a kind of unique looking for still being very much a, this is what I think of when I think of a dive watch. I always really like uh, bright dive watch dials. I say that when I happen to own mine, mine are, I have two dive watches. I have a silver dial and I have a black dial. So I'm not necessarily walking the walk there, but I did used to own an, an orange one, a rotary. And of course, I've looked at Docs a lot. And uh, and the Zodiac watch is pretty, is my silver dial one is pretty colorful. Uh, hey, BJ, hello. Welcome to my lunch live stream. A new experiment in, that I meant to do last week, but I had so much work. The lunch stream happened at dinner time or, or supper time, however you want to think of it. And so, but today I, I did good because I didn't have any meetings uh, scheduled. So I'm just doing like office keeping, bookkeeping work, finance work today. So I was able to actually take a normal lunch. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say about this Tudema. I don't know. I haven't gone to their website at all. I've only looked at this article. So I don't know if they have other interesting watches that people have really gravitated towards, but I thought it looked cool. So I thought we'd talk about it very, very briefly, but that's not the main those are not the main topic I wanted to focus on. My other two topics I think are far more interesting. So let's jump to the second one. So now I'm going to share you Kickstarter. Now, <laughs> full caveats. And this, when I, I looked at it, was still running. This closed earlier today. I have not, I've not only never backed a watch project on Kickstarter. I have never backed a Kickstarter. I am not a proponent of Kickstarter. Uh, and we can go into that if people want to. It doesn't really matter. We all have our own views on these sort of things. It's just the only reason I'm bringing it up is it's got all the images I want because someone shared this with me. Um, and I just thought it was it was interesting because this type of watch is something that I've seen crop up a few times. And that is regarding Nixie tubes. And I see Obese Tuma has noted that he does not have diving experience, even though his name may suggest otherwise. Well, and I am not a professional diver. And I suppose my name being Dennis doesn't suggest anything one way or the other. But if I had a fish name, it would also mean nothing. So 
So anyway, so here is uh, the Quantum Nixie watch. Now, this is not the first Nixie watch. And they had like a $5,000 target. They got up almost $95,000. So da, 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 da. Uh, this decision to wear the mask and the photos, I think, is very like uh, V for Vendetta creepy. So I don't know if that was the best decision. But someone clearly didn't want to be in photos. So I'm assuming that's why they did it. Or perhaps it was for style reasons. But you get a glimpse of the, wa of the watch here. Don't worry. We're going to have more zoomed in images in a moment. But so Nixie tubes, for those of you who aren't familiar, and I probably should have done some more background research on them. I, I had some familiarity with Nixie tubes. They were a Soviet era uh, numeric display option. I believe high consumption of electricity, very, very like a high voltage sort of thing and <clears throat> have fallen out of favor. And my understanding is real Nixie tubes have not by and large, been made at all for years. People have just used the old Soviet stockpiles for Nixie tube projects. I actually was first familiar, I'm sure I've seen Nixie tubes in movies before, but I first became highly familiar with Nixie tubes in my other hobby, pinball, when someone took one of the old uh, Star Trek uh, pinball machines and did rethemed it as a mirror universe of the original series, mirror universe. And if you've ever seen Star Trek, you're probably familiar with mirror universe episodes it's where everything's kind of the opposite. It's like an evil parallel universe. Well, the person for the game did like mirrored everything, put the plunge on the left instead of the right. I mean, it's a really cool project, but one of the things he did for the scores is instead of doing what pinball normally does, which is either use high voltage gas plasma or low voltage fluorescent back in the day. Those were the two main ways to do numeric displays. He used Nixie tubes and it's like, it looked really cool. But, but I was, uh, you know, I looked it up cause I was like, someone had mentioned that to me and it was like, it's hard to get them. So part of this that I thought was interesting when someone linked me the Kickstarter wasn't actually about, they sent it to me because of the watch, but it was this language about them wanting to revive production of actual Nixie tubes. And that's the part of the project I actually think is interesting. I think that this watch is horrifically ugly. I've seen other Nixie tube watches. They all look better than this. And part of that is, look at this. I mean, I mean, if you want to wear a watch that's too large, I, I don't care. It's, it's, it's your wrist. Do what you want. But holy crap, this thing is so big. Um, I, I get it because we're using tubes. But And the very first time I think I ever saw a Nixie tube watch is I think I believe his name is Steve Wozniak. Uh, he was affiliated with Apple at one point. He had a Nixie tube watch, which was compact. And it was like designed where you could you push a little button and it would turn it on. Because of course, because Nixie tubes draw so much energy, they would chew. I mean, you think you got annoyed with a common quartz watch that ate a battery every two years. I mean, these things, holy cow. It was just, I mean, they are a, not, Mary, I see BJ, I'm laughing because I see BJ's note. That looks huge. I don't know if you said it with that emphasis, but that's how I'll say it. And yeah, no, we're going to get down to the specs here in a moment. But so anyway, it seems like that they are, uh, that there was a plant in Ukraine that has been producing these sort of tubes or had the capabilities to produce the tubes. And of course, who knows exactly what's going on right now with the war and the Russian invasion. But so the idea was, as they've noted, most of the equipment was still in existence. And so they could actually do this without having to try and farm up old historic Soviet stock, which is just getting harder and harder. I have looked into doing not a watch, but a Nixie tube clock. There are kits and guides on eBay and or guides online and kits on eBay, I should say. If you ever want to make like a like a desk clock with Nixie tubes. And I've thought about doing that as a project because it's really just a bunch of soldering. Uh, I've never pulled the trigger in part because there are, there are knockoffs, maybe not the right word, but yeah, knockoff versions where you can use like LEDs that look like Nixie's. Cause of course that's what everyone uses now is LEDs. It kind of reminds me of neon. Like I, I have a game room with my pinball machines. I have a real neon sign. It's a lot more expensive to get a real neon sign than it is just using LED signs at this point, because one, you have to find a tube bender who can, who knows the art and two, you know, they're filled with gas, they're high voltage, they burn way more electricity. It's just, you know, there are mistakes made, but uh, but they look cool. It's good throwback. So here are a few more, uh, um, you know, images of this. And it's got aspects of, okay, so it's designed with, I believe, like a gyroscope uh, or something. Uh, we'll find out. There's a way when you flip the wrist, it's supposed to turn the lights on and also give you a button. Um, so... Here are a couple of, uh, here's an image where you can see the, a 
two of the color schemes with it off and the other one with it on. I'm assuming this spot right here, I, I click on the images, they don't get any bigger, uh, is the button to toggle the, the lights to be on. And that's probably just letting you know that it's trying to power them, I guess. Uh, maybe it's a detector of some sort. Uh, this is an interesting part, this case back. Now, I don't want to be mean. I'm not here to be, be mean. I'm not trying to bully quantum. <laughs> But it's like when you read the text here, and I, I get it, it's Kickstarter. They're trying to, there's puffery. They're trying to get people to, to give the money, you know, to support the project. And so you see this where they note designers who worked on this project were able to create what is not noticeable at first glance, the design of the back of the watch. We pay attention to details. So wearing comfort is very important. And they bolded that, wearing comfort. The back of the watch is a special design that sits comfortably on your hand. We tried many designs before we got the perfect one. Now, watches have been around a really long time. And there's a reason why they don't all have this huge... Now, maybe we need a massive groove here. This reminds me of like an irrigation ditch. If any of you are, are familiar with agriculture and irrigation ditches, this is what I thought of when I saw this. Or... You want uh, to do futuristic as <clears throat> Nixie tubes have that sci-fi feel. Let's talk about the uh, the trench run in Star Wars. This is not our Death Star trench that we're running now. I Maybe it is more comfortable than a flat back, given how big this thing is. But I, I just don't know. Because, I mean, my wrist doesn't bulge. Like, I don't have... My, well, let me use the wrist without it. I mean, you know, you got your little, but you got your wrist bone here, your ulna or whatnot, but the wrist itself is flat. I, I don't have like a bone that sticks up like a shark fin that needs to be accommodated. And isn't the other two parts, this is the charge port, by the way, to plug in like a 3.5 millimeter uh, charge plug or whatever the size is. Um, I just, it seems like it just means there's less metal contacting your wrist, but these parts are going to touch. I mean, your whole wrist doesn't fit in that groove. I, I think it's wrist a really weird choice. I sure wouldn't promote it. I don't know why they, I mean, it kind of looks cool in that kind of techie way, but again, it's the back of the watch. Who really cares? So you see some more images of that. So you get some better views and the notation of the charging port, which what I think it's a five watt adapter, but let's get into the features. So I've shown you some of the images. Here you go. Here's the table. Here's the size. 40 millimeters by 54 and unsurprisingly it's almost 17 millimeters thick <laughs> i mean this is like mud master levels of obviously it's not round so so 40 yeah the 40 isn't bad uh isn't a bad length but uh, or width but that length holy cow 54 sheesh it's not going to fit anyone um it's it's just I, again it's about the it's about the tech right it has to be and that's where the thing that caught my eye was that they were going to try and get the IN16 Nixie tubes produced newly produced that you know there's interesting applications for that beyond watches well outside of watches and as Craig Bobby here has noted who will catch us on the flip side if we were to borrow from uh, our our pinball quotes is saying that it's a fascinating project but he agrees that once you look at the design details it becomes less appealing it's i mean given the size of tube that they've chosen what else could they really have done right i mean you'd have to come up with like a super small nixie tube to tr which is what the waz's uh watch was a super small like it's a normal reasonably normal size watch that i as i remember it this seemed more like well, we're going to have these Nixie tubes. Let's build a watch around the Nixie tubes. And I can see that's where people like Obese Tuna will come in and say, sorry, but it looks hideous. And I would say, you know, sorry, but not sorry. I think that's a perfectly fair complaint because this does not look like, I mean, obviously this could only be used as a casual watch at best, but it's so big that it's going to get hung up on everything. So there are a few other things uh, noted, you know, usage and standby times. And they they elaborate on this a little bit more as, as we go down. So, okay, they're not using a gyroscope. They're using an accelerometer. Um, 24 millimeter strap. That's bigger than normal, too. Most for anyone who's possibly tuned in who's not familiar with watch straps, most of them are in the 18 to 22 millimeter. Now, 24 is an unheard of. I actually have a watch that uses a 23, but and at least it's an even number. Uh, so it's not 
totally ridiculous though. I, I mean, what are you, you're not going to want to put this on a leather strap, right? I mean, can you imagine like trying to like, I, you know, it needs ostrich. That's what this needs ostrich. I need that supple ostrich look to really pull off my giant Nixie tube watch. And Craig has said, uh, it reminds me of strapping on two diving tanks onto your wrist. Yeah. And there's a little bit of video here. Now, so here's a picture of it charging. And so just, it's got this, you know, this plug in and the way they're saying it is that the watch is supposed to hold enough charge for 20 days, 20 to 25. But if you have the accelerometer on, then it's about 10 days. Okay. Well, that's not for a Nixie tube watch. That's, that's not bad. I don't think that's bad. They are a huge energy draw. Obviously part of this is not only accommodating these giant tubes, but the fact that you need a pretty big battery uh, you know, the whole reason why quartz watches by and large, the analog ones, why the second hand ticks once a second is it's they're trying to preserve the battery life in those button batteries. That's how they get two years out of them is if they let them sweep like this. I'm wearing my a marathon uh, mechanical field watch, just a cheap uh, mechanical. Uh, I don't remember what Swiss movements in this one of the Edis, I believe, you know, it's. It sweeps because it uses a spring. If we were to, if I were to get the quartz version, it would tick because you would just melt batteries. That's why if you have a double A, like in a battery clock, like I, in my bathroom, I keep a battery analog clock to tell the time. It sweeps the second hand smoothly. Why not? A double A battery is, is plenty of power for a second hand. A button battery is not. So anyway, I'm rambling about batteries and that's not the interesting part. So here's a better shot of this plugged in. I like the quantum tagged uh, plug. Very very thematic. I wonder if it's gold tipped like those old monster audio cables. But so they're saying they're going to do them in titanium and aluminum. Aluminum is an atypical material for a watch. Titanium is not. It's it's become more and more popular. Uh, some more shots of the colors. And here's a video. So you can see how it works with the accelerometer. So you flick the wrist or you can push the button. And obviously it's only two tubes. So they have to show you the hours first and then it cycles to the minutes because they can't show you the whole time all in one go. Could you imagine how much bigger that watch would be? I mean, obviously it's still going to be the 54 millimeters long, but that 40 width might turn into a 50 itself or something. I mean, it would just be ungodly, but you, you look at it even on this guy's wrist and it's just, it's, it's pretty big. It's too big. I would say it's just too big. Here's a picture of the, of the tube cycling. This is actually so you, cause you can disable the accelerometer. if You don't want that to, to turn it on all the time. And of course does military time or you can do uh, or Europe time as they noted, or U S time or how we, we here in America normally like to look at our watches. So yeah, it's got some walkthroughs, which give you some good shots of, I mean, the Nixie tubes themselves look really cool. Uh, I like the idea of the tubes. I think they had some pictures about the, okay. So, Here's the front and back of these new tubes, the Ukrainian produced tubes, which they look like what I'm familiar with, with Nixie tubes. And then here are the Soviet era ones. So really other than the branding, they look very, very close. So I like the authenticity on the, the Nixie part is interesting. That's the exciting part. I could, if I supported Kickstarter projects, I could definitely see supporting a project to get Nixie tubes reproduced for like you know, homebrew stuff, do it, you know, D DIY sort of things. Not for a watch though. Not like this, not like this. So, oh, they didn't reach their hundred thousand. So we don't get to know what goal three was, I guess, but they got different backlights and they got the titanium or at least the titanium gets to be polished now. So anyway, that's the, that's the quantum watch. Yeah. Someone shared that uh, with me on one of my pinball discords. And I just thought, okay, it, it's, it's an abomination, but it's interesting at this, at the same time. And they even note in this somewhere in the in the write up that they know they're not the first Nixie tube watch. Uh, they might be the ugliest. I don't I don't know. But again, I do think it is pretty interesting that they are financing to get Nixie tube production, fresh production back. I I would rather have seen something along these lines with different tube sizes and just saying we want to restart uh, and get a new supply of tubes because this is getting really hard to get those Soviet tubes now. And they did get about $95,000. So, I mean, they, they generated quite a bit, but uh, just one of those, just one of those things. So that was the main aspect I wanted to talk about with our, with the Nixie watches. We do have one more topic, but I'm going to take a drink here and I'm just going to scan chat, make sure I, I stayed caught up. I think I did. Hmm. Okay. So we've talked about 
Tatima, Tatuma, Tatima, the the German, the German brand we talked about. I'll put it back up. You know, first topic was was this this PVD watch from the Glashuta company I had not heard of, Tutima, German. So I know I'm missaying it. Um, and I'd see, uh, on, and then of course we've done the Nixie ones, and I've seen. Uh, that's why I'm jumping back to it. Is BJ noting? Isn't there a potential for supply chain issues from Ukraine? And yes, I would say yes. In fact, in the article, or not the article, in the Kickstarter, you know summary uh you know descriptor that they provided in story they really talked about all this work and the samples that they got from ukraine in 2021 well as we are all aware 2021 was before the russian invasion now i know ukraine is still like their economy is still running as a country especially at this point where the invasion focus is still in the eastern part of the nation and it's not you know, it's not that whole pincer trying to go in and, and get Kiev. It's it's now really focused on the area Russia's trying to annex. I don't know where this factory is, though. So is this near Crimea? Is this near the area where all the territory and fighting is? Or is it in, in or is it instead in an area away from the Russian ground forces? But granted, it might still end up being hit by missile. I mean, you know, bluntly speaking, the Russians haven't seemed to be very discriminatory with their with their missile attacks. But even if they were attacking a factory, could make sense from a mil. If they thought that well, this place might build Nixie tubes, but they might also build something you know, militarily uh, capable. Um, I yes, BJ, I do think that would be a, that would be one of the many red flags I would have. I mean, most of my red flags on this are it's a watch that no human being can wear. Maybe you could wear this on your calf or something. Leg watch. Yeah, leg watch. That's a thing. Let's make that a thing. But um, but yeah, definitely a uh, a a a weird one. But the Nixie tube side, yeah, that that supply chain issue is. I think it's a huge concern. Part of the reason I wouldn't back a project for Nixie tubes built in Ukraine at this point. And I just see a message that says super sticker. Thank you. That's actually the first time anyone's ever <laughs> done a sticker or a or a you know I guess what in Twitch it's bits, right? I'm used to Twitch bits from when I used to live stream pinball, but. But uh, first time I've seen it in uh, in in YouTube, so I know I turned on a bunch of stuff for monies. But uh, so thank you, Craig. That's very generous of you. And uh, Craig says it's the Japanese dog movement emoji. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, yes. So anyway, a very 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 uh, weird one. Um, thank you, uh, Craig, for the uh, for the funds for the sticker, super sticker, like superstar. I don't know if you're familiar with Saturday Night Live. It used to be a bit with superstar, but um. I'm, I'm dating myself at this point, or at least remembering a much more fun time of uh, Saturday Night Live. Now, let's jump to the most traditional topic I lined up for this lunch live stream. And the one I I think had a lot more kind of juicy little bits in here. Yeah, it's going to be pretty speculative, folks. But you know what? That's what we do. That's what we do in hobbies. Is we just we say things. We don't know if they're true or not. It's rumors. We rumor tain each other. You know, that's probably not a phrase, but let's invent it. Rumor tamed. Are you not rumor tamed? Well, we'll find out here in a moment. And I see Craig either knows the superstar or just likes how I say it. Superstar. Yeah. There was a whole movie about that character. It was one of those. It was back when they were strong enough to get their own own films like uh, Night at the Roxbury. But all right. So Bluebell. Now, if you're like me and you saw this, you ignored the word activist and you saw Bluebell and you thought ice cream. And you're like, what does Richemont group have to do with ice cream. And for those of you not familiar, Richemont is one of the large conglomerates in watch in watchmaking. So there are three kind of big ones, I would say. There's there's Richemont, there's Swatch Group, which is the one that's got the most watch companies under it. And I believe there's a third one that I am blanking on right now. I guess normally what I would say is actually not a Swiss one, but would say Seiko. Because you've got Seiko, which under it has Credor, Grand Seiko, and, and uh, Orient. So those three always jump in my mind. Like they, the companies underneath have their own control. They have their own, you know, design styles. Like Swatch controls Omega. They control Swatch. They control Flick Flack. They control Blanc Pond. Those all still have their own identities, but they all operate at the behest of the conglomerate. Richemont's like that as well. Richemont, I feel, is more diversified though. And that's kind of what gets what this activist Bluebell gets at per Reuters. 
Uh, thank you. Well, I say it before I pop it up on screen. Apologies for that, BJ. Exactly. LVMH. That's the one I wanted to mention. LVMH. So I knew there was a Swiss one. And I'm, like, I'm choking on it. And I know it's not the Hans Wilsdorf Foundation. So, so thank you, BJ. I very much appreciate it. Say, so, okay. So this was news from yesterday. So Bluebell Capital Partners. Okay. They are invested into the Richemont Group. Okay. What they have said is nutshell and you can see the you can see the quote here before the before the ad that's kind of getting quasi blocked and I'll highlight it but basically I'll just paraphrase it and say that one of their partners at Bluebell has said we Richemont needs to just focus on jewelry and watches not this other stuff like that's what they want them to drill down at and be you need to embrace your jewelry and you need to embrace your watches okay so why would they say that well there is an issue that came up regarding one of the acquisitions recently. I'm going to scroll down a little bit uh, with what, what's been going on. And they had picked up a company relatively recently. And I'm trying to find it where they've not been doing well. And I wanted to highlight which one it was. I hadn't heard of it. And that's why I wanted to note it. Uh, so let's see. Apologies for... I should have re-re-re-reviewed this to know exactly where I was looking for it. Let's see. You notice that that's saying Chopinian's its focus was help Reachmont narrow the discount and valuation to French group Hermes, which of course is a famous brand. Uh, there's a part here I've highlighted that I will get back to that I want to uh, that I want to focus on, but I want to touch on that weird uh, that weird acquisition first. And let's see. They've noted that they thought that uh, that Reachmont group overall would be would be focusing on. I see Obisa said the caring group. I don't think that's it. And that's why I, I know I saw it in here. It's not a very long piece. There we go. Here it is. The company which makes, car the company being Richemont, which makes Cartier jewelry and IWC watches made a mistake by taking ownership of loss making online retail business YOOX, Yooks, Net a Porter. I don't know what Yooks Net a Porter is, but apparently it's not doing well. So no, it wasn't the caring group. It was, it was that, it was that acquisition. And so this, this person with this investment group, uh, Bluebell has gone in saying, Hey, you know, that was dumb. We want you just to focus on jewelry and watches. That's where you can make all of this money. We should be making money doing that. They're also a little bit here regarding where they're trying to, Bluebell's trying to get a seat on, on the board. Uh, and that talks about who the who the person is that they want, but but okay, so that's one piece. All right, and I get that. I could see where, especially like 2020, 2021, where watches and jewelry, I'm sure, but I, I I'm not as I was gonna say I'm not as familiar with jewelry. I like I'm unfamiliar with jewelry, but just bluntly, I'm unfamiliar with jewelry. We know watches did really well in the pandemic, so I could definitely see why the thoughts are focus on that, not focus on like some. The online you know, storefront business sort of things. But one of the aspects that they also had mentioned in here, which I thought was a fascinating thing to discuss, was this person had suggested Richemont rename itself, rename itself to the Cartier Group to capitalize on the branding. And that's an interesting idea. And that's actually one that I think I I would say I agree. I, I could get behind. It's It's kind of funny. Because I, I have I have a, a bit of a mixed opinion on it. Because one of the inconvenient things that we've had when discussing the uh, issue with Swatch, right, is there's Swatch Group and then there's Swatch the brand. Swatch Group has control over Omega and Blancpain. Swatch the brand makes plastic watches, and that's what they do. And the designers at the at, at Swatch the brand don't want, get to walk into Blancpain and say you're going to change your fifty fathoms to the five fathoms. And you're going to use bio ceramic, you know, like they right, they're separate. But the Swatch Group is the conglomerate, so it's a little confusing. Uh, I always have to. It's not that hard to follow in the sense that I can always say Swatch, like I say Swatch Group, with Group every single time. I mean the conglomerate. But I could see where people might think if I say Swatch. Well, is he talking the brand or is he talking the conglomerate? So we could run into that if we were to rename. I mean, Richemont isn't a watch brand so anytime anyone says richemont we know we're talking about the conglomerate but but on that that said when i hear richemont until i got into watches it meant nothing to me lvmh is the same way it means nothing to me as an abbreviation but 
you were to say Cartier Group, I'd be like, oh, Cartier, holy crap, they're a huge jeweler. They're also a huge watchmaker. I mean, I know they identify themselves as a jeweler first and foremost, but most of us who have been in the hobby for even a, a, a relatively small period of time are, are pretty aware of Cartier and its impact, you know, basically pioneering men's watches at the turn of the last century. So that I just thought was an interesting thing and maybe worth discussion. Like, is that smart? Does this make sense? I don't know enough about Richemont's books. I'm trying to think if I've ever pulled them. Like I've pulled the annual reports for Swatch Group. I can't remember if I did it for, for Richemont to try and figure out. I was curious at one point, I'll put the quote back up here while I'm talking because you all don't need to see my giant head as a giant head. It can be a small little head. The, um, with Richemont, I knew about the focus on more than just watches and jewelry. Uh, what I was doing when I was pulling annual reports, and again, that was on Swatch Group, was I was trying to figure out like, are all the brands making money? I was wanting to do research to find out whether or not Swatch in Swatch Group had been losing money in the wake of Apple Watch and everything else, that that was kind of like, why are we doing the moon swatch? Like, I always assumed that was a swatch bailout. And I still think that given their refusal to sell them online, it seems to be a tool to prop up the retail presence. There's To me, I don't see any other reason to do it like that because swatch is not a luxury brand. You know, Omega is, I, you know, I, they're different, you know, different philosophies. So, so anyway, with, with this, it, I get it. It makes sense. I, I, I could see why, where they're coming from on this. I don't know what all else, I, obviously that that's online retail thing was, uh, was, was seen as a, as a big mistake. This Ukes net a porter, but I don't know what the rest of the portfolio looks like. And I guess, I mean, is the idea to spin all that off and then just keep the, I mean, I'd assume so, you know, get out of it, spin those off and, uh, and just focus on watches and, and jewelry. So, and again, I should, I, you know, I probably could have you know pulled up. What are the big, re I mean, obviously IWC and Cartier are, are two that I actively look at watches all the time uh, from under Richemont. I know they have a, a few others, not as diverse as Swatch Group, but, but um, anyway, just one of those, an interesting thing. Uh, not so much interesting about the idea of the, of the plug. Um, and the, yeah, one of the things I see Obese Tuna has noted is that the, uh, is the Reach Monster the holding company. Uh, and I guess their idea is the holding company, Bluebell's idea is the holding company would have more value if it actually renamed to Cartier. The Cartier group is the holding, or as I kept saying, the conglomerate. And and doing it like that. But uh, again, I don't know if it matters all that much. Like, where does that make the difference? Ultimately, it's the product names that I assume move things. I see. Oh, Joel, thank you for the uh, non super sticker. Uh, <laughs> uh, Craig did a super sticker earlier and I didn't, couldn't see what the super sticker was. He had to explain to me it was the Japanese dog movement emoji because all I saw is it say super sticker. But uh, very generous of you. Uh, you have showed up late. Well, you know, I only had it scheduled for four hours, Joel. So you could have planned around me, but you didn't care. Uh, in terms of lunch, I went and picked up a place called Salty Iguana, which, as the name might suggest, is Iguana. No, I'm kidding. It's not Iguana. It's a, it's a Mexican restaurant. So I had a beef taco salad with um, their house dressing, which is sort of a Thousand Islandy sort of thing. And then... They get you, you get a, I picked it up, but I still get a bag of chips with salsa. So the chips with salsa will be dinner because the, you know, it's one of those shelled uh, salads where you have the whole big bowl made. So it's, you know, it's probably a thousand calories at least. So that can be my big meal for the day. And then the rest of it are, <laughs> the rest of it will just be chips. I, I'm living, I'm living the healthy life. I, I can feel it. Um, so yeah, that was interesting though, overall. I just I thought it was an interesting statement. I was just searching for some watch news this morning. I saw that and I'd missed it yesterday. And so BJ has said, I would be interested to see a Mont Blanc and, Ra and Ralph Lauren are performing. And yeah, again, I was so I was sorely disappointed when I pulled the Swatch Group report because it didn't say. Like it's a it's a multi-page report. It talks about all of their groups, like all the divisions in the group, like like flick flack and and omega like each one's listed 
I thought surely they're going to do a breakdown by class, right? Like class code. And they're going to say, here's how much revenue and expenses Omega had and what the net profit was. Nope. The conglomerate, the group, the holding company, it had its money totals, its revenue they made listed. But other than vague narrative statements saying Omega had a really strong year, but they didn't show me like, where's the data? I didn't get to see the raw numbers. So I, I'm like, I believe them. I'm not saying they're lying, but I'm like, this is not. I mean, it's I, I come from the nonprofit world. Every, every month I produce financial reports on the status of the association I run for my, not just my board, but my secretary treasurer who has to review and sign off on those financials. I always include a profit and loss statement, or we call it a, we call it something a little bit dif different. We have a statement of financial position because uh, we're a nonprofit, but uh, and a balance sheet and, and um, anyway, we, you know, all, all the things are slightly named differently, but they get the balance sheet, they get the profit and loss statement, they get an actual versus budget. And when it comes to our review, yeah, we're really only focused on the overall organization on a month by month basis, but annually, like when setting the budget, there's a breakdown by class. And I say class because that's something that QuickBooks uses. And so class codes are how I carve up projects and grants. So you can see how well, like how much money are we making by this project? Uh, my old job, when I would do it, we used class codes to divide the organization up into categories. We were, we were another quasi public entity. So like how much did we spend on lobbying? Lobbying was a class code. Our conferences were a class code and they were a moneymaker. How did we know how much? Well, it was easy. We just looked under that class code and saw how much revenue we spent and how much, you know, how much staff time and everything else counted on the expense side of the ledger and all of that. So I just thought that an annual report would have that level of detail and it didn't. And I don't, I don't think it was Richemont I pulled the other one for. I pulled another, might have been LVMH. It was the same problem. I could not, no, it was Seiko. I could not tell. Like, I want to know, is Orient making money? I can't tell. I mean, I couldn't tell how much. They said it was doing well. Well, okay, that's great. But, but, but I wish I knew more. And Joel said, I mean, I had lunch. I had to eat too. I'll make sure to be on time next time. Well, look, next time it might be a different time. Last week, lunch live stream. I've decided it's a good alliteration. So lunch live stream was at 5 p.m. Central because lunch live stream had to be punted to the end of the day because I had meetings and I had all these things come up. And so I had all this big plan of, you know what? There's always people who I don't watch a lot of watch live streams. The ones I'm familiar with have been just, uh, it's like this is like talking head format, except there's like more people, which I can do with the software. People like wanted to have a conversation on it, but like they do that at night. It was what my point was. And I was kind of like, hey, you know, maybe people want something when they're on lunch or around the middle of the day, or it's, you know, obviously it's in the evening when we talk Europe. So I just started thinking, you know what, maybe I'm being a little too uh, samey by always doing it like at 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. Basically, I'd wait till any TV shows or anything I wanted to do were done, and then I'd come on and do it. And I'm also so tired of, by then. I, like work-wise, as of 4 p.m. my time, I, I'm a mess. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I do my best work in the morning. So I try and, and front load all of the stuff I need to do that requires me to think early in the day. And then as we prattle along, if it's just meetings, it's our, you know, as long as people know I can be a little snarky. Other than that, it's sort of like, let's not schedule anything like the last hour of the day because I'm a mess. But, but may it doesn't apply with watches. I don't know. The, uh, the live stream quantities are always about the same because I'm such a small channel. But anyway, so that's, the story behind all of that. Well, anyway, so those are the three topics we had. Bluebell with Richemont, Quantum Nixie Watch, and, and Tutima's M2. I'll go back to that. I want to look, I want to end with looking at these Nixie watches again. I, I, I want This is my favorite, just because it's hanging over the wrist so much, so badly. Like everyone, everyone and their mother would be like, that's not, something's not right with that. Something's not, that's not, that's not right. We we know why it's not right. It's because it's too way too way too big, way too big. But I think we could strap these to our legs. I think that's the key. I, and it, again, the groove. I just like the tube. Again, I'm 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 
I'm being really repetitive, but the Nixie tubes are super cool and everything else about this feels like a mistake. I mean, I don't care that there's an accelerometer in it. Uh, I don't care that it can do US or European time. The charge port, I don't think it'd be that uncomfortable, but it'd probably have been more comfortable on the side of the watch. It's, it's tough. It's tough to say. See, Joel said, wake up with watches with Dennis. There's your morning show. And for those that don't know Joel, and that, why would they? I haven't mentioned it in so long. Joel is who actually designed the Watches with Dennis logo. The one with the gradient shading and the W that becomes a D. That's, that's a Joel design. I should have sent him a Nixie watch as a thank you, but I didn't know these abominations were going to possibly exist. Uh, BJ has said, great topics. Good question about changing the Richemont group name. Yeah, it's just, uh, the article's not about that. It was such a throwaway line. I almost missed it, but I was just like, holy cow, that's such an interesting thought experiment. Only because we know of one that, it wasn't a name change, but we know of one that does that, Swatch Group, right? And when I hear Swatch Group, you know, Swatch Group does do more than watches. That's all I think about though, because I hear the word Swatch and that's what they're known for is watches. Joel says, Zach probably loves it. Watch it be your Christmas gift. And for those that don't know, he's Zach is a, is one of my, I, I host two pinball podcasts and Zach is one of the co-hosts on one of the shows. And Zach sends me stupid Christmas presents, like, you know, all of the Toy Story movies and stuff, things that I won't watch. So yeah, sending me a, a wristwatch that I wouldn't wear would be right up his alley. So, but don't worry, he's assuredly not watching this. He's probably busy trying to save his business as the market collapses. So, so I'm sure I'm sure he's quite occupied. And Obese Tuna says that it, and by it, I'm sure he means the quantum Nixie watch. Oh, I got to put it back up on the screen. Quantum Nixie watch makes his Cartier look rather small. Well, size matters not is the first thing. And, but I mean, to be fair, what wouldn't look small? Like the mud masters are around like this. All right. So for those don't know, all right. So this is 40, this is 40 millimeters long lengthwise 50 or excuse me wide. Oh my God. I'm, I'm messing up. That's already getting too late. It's 40 wide. It's 54 long. And then it's about 17 thick. Now that's the thick watch, by the way. Um, like the thickest watch I own is I think around 13 and a half millimeters. Um, but 54 holy crap i mean the casio g-shock mudmaster right it's it's like 54 55 isn't it it's the biggest thing i can think of it and that's a real watch right maybe some panerais the the old fliegers the ones the nazis wore on their jackets they were designed to be worn around the their leather jackets on the outside of the sleeve those were like what 52 54 that's the size we're talking about. This is for you to wear a parka with, not to put on flesh, on soft, squishy human flesh. BJ has said, I don't want to keep you. Well, I was planning to go at least an hour, BJ, so don't feel bad about it. Uh, BJ says, I don't want to keep you, but any thoughts on the Grand Seiko SBG Y009? Well, the problem with Grand Seiko is I do not know immediately when I hear reference numbers what one we're talking about. So. Let's load it up and see if we can find a picture of it. So let me turn that chat off. And I think I've got it here. Yep. Spring drive manual SBGY009. Well, and other folks can wait. And this is a real watch site. So we can zoom in so you can get a better look at the watch. Okay. So it's the modern Grand Staco aesthetic. It's following the grammar of design, which they always do. So we've got the GS Grand Seiko logo uh, branding up at the top at the 12. Towards the 6, we see just the spring drive logo. Very symmetrically balanced dial. No date. Um, movement information is right there at the base. And here's a picture of the movement. Does this use a display case back? These pictures do not tell me, so let's scroll down. And maybe uh, BJ knows. The dial I like, in my defense, or maybe to my detriment, I can't think of a single Grand Seiko dial I don't like. Grand Seiko and their dials, it's like, who's, who, Mosier. Mosier might, would probably be the only brand I could name for you that does a better dial. And with Mosier, though, they're all, I, I know they do more than this. With Mosier, all I think of is their Fume dials, right? Like, not 
Grand Psycho does texturing. They have really interesting radiant dials, all of this. And BJ is saying, yes, okay. So this has a display case back. And I'm assuming then, given that, that it's got the power reserve on the back uh, through the display case back. Overall, though, yeah, I uh, I like the look of this watch. I um I do have a Grand Seiko spring drive. Um, it's in the it's in the case now, so I I don't have it with me. I'm, I'm wearing my my little marathon today. Um, but the one I have is one of their old. It's in the Heritage collection as well. So again, one of my other biases. I'm already biased towards the Heritage collection because I own one. It's uh when they discontinued it last year. It's that that champagne radiant dial, the the well champagne colored one with the with the spring drive, uh, the old spring drive model. And it it has the power reserve on the front and a closed case back. But the power reserve wasn't cut into the dial. They just printed it. So it's there's not that weird 3D texture. That was always the most, and I would still live with it, like with a, with a snowflake or whatever. I would totally live with the cut in spring drive that I always thought it looked a little weird. So I've preferred the power reserve indicator on the spring drives to either be just printed on the dial, like they did, on, I think only on a few of the older ones. Or what they're now doing, putting it on the back, because you just keep this really clean. So the dial, other than the the aesthetic of the of the art itself, you know, this texturing. I want to see that texturing. I don't want other three dimensional aspects other than like indices in the hands. And, you know, the powers are being sunken in. Always felt a little weird to me. Like it adds depth, but it's not symmetrical depth. Um, and my watch has a has a date on it. I actually as a I, Again, as a lot of us, I actually prefer the look of the symmetry of no date. This ain't pinball where asymmetry rules. Uh, symmetry is just very, very attractive. So I prefer the layout of this dial to the, to my Grand Seiko. I also like this yellow hour hand. I, it, it's a it's it looks really nice. In fact, I I had not looked at this one before, but yeah, I see where they're getting this whole full moon uh, over mountains vibe with it. The uh, the only okay, and it's only forty millimeters too. Yeah, the other the only thing with Grand Seikos historically is most of them were larger. The reason I got the champagne style one that I did is um I I bought it because of the uh it was smaller than it was like 39. It wasn't a 42 or whatever. In fact, I'll go ahead and pull it up here. Uh I'm I'm looking up <laughs> I told you I can't remember reference numbers. I'm I'm loading up my my files on my computer in my explorer because I'm trying to because I have so much trouble with reference numbers, what I do is I keep track of all my photos and my watches and I write the reference numbers of the models in the folders so that I, I don't have to remember when I do videos. All right. So mine was the SBGA 283. I'll go ahead and show you guys what that one looks like. As I noted, it got discontinued, it seems, last year, which isn't too surprising to me. It had been out a, a really long time, I think. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to pull it up on on Grand Seiko's website. So, but just to give you a sense of what of the version that I ended up having, for some reason it disappeared the moment I switched. Ah, because it's trying to pop up an ad. All right, so this is what I have. So you see, a lot of the a lot of the stuff is the is the grammar of design language. I see this this newer version does the double bar, which I like that too. I, I just think it's easier to read. These are actually fatter. They did fatter ones on the three, or excuse me, not on the three because of there's there's the date, but on the six, nine, and twelve, they did the fatter. And you see the spring drive is just printed. They didn't carve it in. So these have closed case backs though, is why they did it like that. So anyway, no, I overall actually I like this. I like the look of the dial design here more than the one I own. I'd say the only thing I probably prefer about the one I I have is I really am a big fan of the champagne color, but I mean I like the blue with texture. It looks just looks really clean with that offset uh, offset color. And for I'm gonna say pity it's limited though. I see it's limited to 1,500 units, uh, which would explain the $8,100 price. These, uh, yeah, I think 3,800 was the retail price. I I bought mine off of Chrono 24 new. I think mine cost around 3,200. I bought it um, about, a, I think about a year and a half ago. They hadn't been discontinued yet. Um, I was doing research and wanted to pull it up on the website and couldn't find it anymore is how I found out they were discontinued. Uh, so let's see. Uh, BJ has noted the Sea of Clouds is a beautiful dial. Yeah, no, I mean, so much of what Grand Seiko does is just absolutely stunning. And 
Uh, you know, it is unfortunate from a collector perspective that their prices are going up, but for such a long time, they, they were such a good deal. And I don't think they're a bad deal. I would say my overall sense is they are a fair deal. You do need to be a little careful, I think, with these limiteds. Like they, they like to add an upcharge on limiteds. And what, this is not surprising. Seiko under the brand Seiko has been doing that for a long time. Omega plays that game too, where they'll just be like, well, let's do a limited version of this watch. We'll make something cool about it and we'll really upcharge it. And the only thing is the false, false scarcity that they chose to create, which is kind of sucky, but it's a game all of them seem to play, or at least a lot of them play. And I see Obese Tuna has said 36 millimeters would be more than sufficient in a watch like that. And yeah, even the, uh, and the, the one I have, the, uh, the 283, I believe that is a, yeah, it's a, I just, I went back to the, I'll, I'll share it again. But um, let me turn your chat uh, off so you can kind of see it off here to the side is a, uh, it's 39 millimeter. It wears kind of large for that. Part of that is this is like that first generation spring drive in this. And so it's, it's just a, a thick watch. I mean, if we want to talk about negatives with Grand Seiko, I can give you some of my, at least with my experience. Um, so the watch is, is it's thick for what it is. Like when you think about the diameter of the watch, it can be off putting at least on the older spring drive movements, just how thick that thing is for how big the diameter is. That might not be so true with the more modern spring drives that they've been, they've been producing. I don't know. I haven't handled those. Uh, the other thing that you probably heard a lot of people say is the bracelet. The bracelet is not uncomfortable, but it's horrible to size. So the way they do their bracelet is, you know, on, on a typical bracelet, there, there are basically three types of bracelets I, I'm really familiar with. There's the pin and collar system, which is kind of like the cheap system that you see on a lot of lower end watches where there's a pin and then a collar holds it in the middle and you have to hammer it out. Okay. So I think most of you are familiar with those. Then there's the cotter pin system, which is what most of my pin systems have been, where one end is flanged. You still have to hammer it out, but it doesn't have the collar, and it's all one piece. And, and as far as pin systems go, I like that one better. It's you know, There's not a little dinky thing to mess with. And then a lot of luxury watches use screws that just go all the way through, you know, thread it on one end, watch head on another, and that's my favorite style. Grand Seiko, at least with the, the SBGA 283's bracelet, is there's a screw head on each end. You unscrew that, and those screws are teeny, teeny, tiny in length, and they are holding a pin in. So instead of a collar, you're like capping the end with two screws, and there's a pin in that holds the bracelet together. Part of my bitterness to this is, of course, I dropped one of those screws when I was sizing my bracelet and lost it on the carpet. Had to get out of shop vac, vacuum the whole carpet, and then go through the shop vac and find the dang thing with a magnet because it was so small. I mean, we're talking watchmaker screw size. It's super small. And um, no micro adjust. So you had to do it like that. It, the, the bracelet on the on the 283 does have, have half links. So you can get a reasonable fit, but... When you consider that the watch was over $3,000, it kind of begs the question, why is your bracelet so crap? Once you, once I got it sized, it was all right. Now, the other thing on mine, and it may be very different for the, uh, for the, for the 40 millimeter, the SBG Y009 that we just looked at, I'll put back up, but the lug width on mine is 21. So an odd number. So it sucks to find good bands for it. I actually am wearing it on a real cheap, I got off of Amazon, uh, properly sized though, blue leather strap. And I switched it from the bracelet just because I was getting, uh, again, my bracelet sized reasonably well, but it just, the watch is already pretty thick. It feels kind of heavy. I thought, let me try it on the leather. I, I don't really love it much more than that. It's a quick release uh, leather strap though, so I can take that off easy if I want to. I thought about toying around with some other options with it, but. Um, cause I love the way the Grand Seiko looks. Uh, it's one of my favorite watches to wear, but, uh, like aesthetically, I just such a great, it's my, it's one of my most favorite dials. Um, and I actually got rid of my other champagne dial watches, uh, because it's so much better than, than the other ones like my Hamilton I had, but yeah, those bracelets can be frustrating, but this, uh, the one we just looked at and you know, it's on a leather strap, so it's not going to have that problem. But anyway. I'm going to go back to work. I think we've talked about plenty of stuff. 
We've occupied you all for an hour. You all can go back to your lives, doing fun things. I want to thank Craig and Joel both for the for the super sticker and the and the donation. First time ever on this channel for that. Uh, very kind of you. Way more than I don't ask people to to the, do that stuff. I'm not like those evening streamers where they only highlight the chats that are the super chats who gave them money. That's not how good discussions flow. So 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 I'm just like. That's just the way it needs to be. And then, oh my God, all these pinball people, Marv Loco. Uh, I know, I know all these pinball people. And he's like, work, what is that? Marv does pinball for a living. So for him, work is play or not. I don't know. I don't know exactly what he does in pinball. Probably evil, nefarious things. But um, absolutely, BJ, thanks for stopping by. Hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, thanks, Obese Tuna. Always great to see you around. Always great. I always enjoy your comments that you leave on most of the videos. Uh, very insightful. And Marv notes he owns watches. Like, yeah, sometime we might need to do a what is what is it? A Modavo? You have a Modavo, I think. We might need to do a special on Modavo museum watches. Maybe if I if I'm if my memory is still serving right. It's not as not as I don't have the acumen I used to. As I've gotten older, it's getting harder to think, but I'm doing my best. So anyway, that's it, everyone. I'm gonna close it out. Take care. Have a great day and a great weekend soon. Goodbye.